everybody welcome to the whiteboard doctor and welcome whiteboard doctors uh, for those who of you who have seen other videos or subscribe or follow our channel uh, thank you for checking out videos for those who are new welcome for the first time feel free to subscribe check out some other videos hit the bell get notifications whatever you want to do we are a free open access medical education channel here to learn with and from you and hopefully teach you a little something in the meantime uh, I previously made a video on abnormal uterine bleeding, and part of that video was the differential diagnosis of Palm Cohen. Uh, I'll link that video here if you want to take a peek. Um, now, the subsequent video videos are going to be on each part of that uh, differential diagnosis of Palm Cohen, uh, the P in Palm being polyp for endometrial polyp. So endometrial polyps are a cause of abnormal uterine bleeding. We're going to focus in on that for this video, and again, uh, check out the video on, you know, introduction to abnormal uterine bleeding uh, for additional information on that. So endometrial polyps. Um, here, I put in a picture of what they look like on hysteroscopy. Um, the epidemiology, I think, is what we will start with. Um, so endometrial polyps are uh, something that increases with incidence with age, right? So the Increase incidence with increased age. The older you get, the more likely you are to have an endometrial polyp. Uh, they're most common in 40 to 50 year old women. And they are typically benign. Um, but I do want to say that uh, in 1 to 2% of premenopausal women, they can be malignant. So it's important to get them removed and tested, you know, sent to pathology. Um, and then in about 5% of postmenopausal women, so post premenstrual, not premenstrual, this is menopausal. Let's erase that. Good. Um, so 1 to 2% of premenopausal women, they're malignant. And about 5% of postmenopausal women, they are malignant. Um, so just to note, you know, you want to get these removed. You want to send them to pathology to ensure that they're not actually malignant, that they are benign. Good. So what are they? The pathogenesis of these are that they're actually just endometrial hyperplasia. Um, and I drew that here. This is, you know, what my, you know, very artistic drawing looks like. Um, so it's endometrial tissue. Um, it's an overgrowth of endometrial glands and stroma over this vascular core, which is this helix of blood vessels. Again, very artistic. Thank you. Um, so it's a benign overgrowth, usually, sometimes malignant or premalignant, of endometrial glands and stroma over a vascular core. Um, they typically express both uh, ER, um, estrogen receptors, and progesterone receptors on the tissue. Um, what causes them, though? So there are several kind of theories on what causes them. Um, one theory is that uh, this tissue specifically overexpresses aromatase. So aromatase, um, you can all look that up. If you have any questions, you can put them in the question box and I can comment on it. Um, but that this tissue has an increased expression of aromatase and thus gets this uh, overgrowth, this hypertrophy, causing a polyp in that one area. Um, there's also thoughts about um, transcription groups. Uh, so there's some thoughts that there's a rearrangement of a specific transcription group. Ooh, I just got an email. Let's mute that, eh? Muted. Uh, increased rearrangement of transcription, transcription groups um, that causes this hyperplasia. Um, and another one is that there's actually a monoclonal, um, so a single, you know, endometrial cell has a monoclonal expansion that then causes this polyp. You know, these aren't all that important either for, you know, management or diagnosis, but just a quick peek in the pathogenesis. I mostly just wanted to try to draw a cervical polyp. So risk factors. Risk factors for endometrial polyps are several. Um, so the first is going to be tamoxifen use. Um, so patients who are on tamoxifen who had previously had breast cancer or something of the such, or an increased risk for endometrial polyps. If you think about it, I mean, they have um, estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, uh, tamoxifen modulates those. Um, so sometimes patients on tamoxifen have more polyps. Obesity, obese patients secrete more estrogen. Um, so it might, you know, make sense that they have increased incidence of endometrial polyps. And then postmenopausal hormone therapy, which again, postmenopausal hormone therapy with estrogen, 
I'm just going to do hormone, we'll just write it all out. Hormone therapy with estrogen is also going to increase the incidence of endometrial polyps. So clinical presentation, this is where we get into abnormal uterine bleeding. Again, check out that video if you want to. Um, but just briefly, the vast majority of these patients are actually going to be um, found incidentally. So the vast majority of them are asymptomatic, right? Many people can have endometrial polyps, but they won't have any symptoms, right? But about 64 to 88% of patients with endometrial polyps will have abnormal uterine bleeding, menorrhagia, menorrhagia, um, you know, breakthrough bleeding, heavy bleeding, um, all that. Primarily, though, in these patients, it is just spotting, so just very light, you know, spotting between menstrual uh, periods. Um, some of these patients will have uh, iron deficiency, right, and because of that, they can have a microcytic anemia and can have some of those symptoms of anemia, dizziness, orthostasis, um, weakness, fatigue, all that kind of stuff. So just general anemia symptoms. So the two symptoms, um, what's right weak there? The two big symptoms you can see are abnormal uterine bleeding, usually just spotting in between periods, and then symptoms concerning for anemia, um, right? So this uh, dizziness, fatigue, weakness, orthostasis, those types of things. Um, but the vast majority of the patients are going to be asymptomatic, and it might just be an incidental diagnosis that is found. All right. So let's scroll down now. Um, let's go with diagnosis. So how do we diagnose it? Let me actually bring in, let's do this, let's bring in a picture here. Give me one second. Picture, good. So this here, oh, is it going to let me move it? No, that's fine, we can leave it there. So diagnosis uh, typically is with transvaginal ultrasound, or TVUS. Um, it's about 91% sensitive and 90% specific. So this is sensitive, this is specific. Um, you can see here, this is a transvaginal ultrasound, and you have all these masses seen. Um, so this here, I actually, let me just outline this, that might be helpful. So here, if you follow it, is the uterus. Um, so out here, this is all the endometrium, myometrium, everything like that. And then these here are the polyps, which are in this darker area, which is the endometrial canal, okay? Um, so transvaginal ultrasound is your first line. It's fairly specific and sensitive. Um, you can do a few things that are more specific and sensitive if the transvaginal ultrasound um, is uh, indeterminate or uncertain, uh, but these are more invasive. Um, so you could do hysteroscopy, hysteroscopy where you actually take a um, camera, go up the cervix through the vaginal canal into the uterus and try to actually visualize um, the polyps itself. Um, this can be helpful because you can also biopsy doing this where obviously you can't biopsy doing a transvaginal ultrasound. Uh, you can also do something called a say, oh I should say a hysteroscopy is about 90% sensitive but it's more specific, it's about 93% specific so if you're uncertain you get a little more specificity. Um, and then you can do this saline infusion sonogram. It's called sonohysterography. I personally have never seen this done, um, but I am not an ob doctor, so it very well could be done, uh, hysterography. Um, and this is the most sensitive. It's 95% sensitive, 92% specific. Um, so to diagnose, typically it's going to be transvaginal ultrasound which you can see over here, um, and I can erase all this so you can get a good look at what it actually looks like. Um, you can see the spot polyps. So if you're uncertain, um, you can do hysteroscopy, at which point you can uh, do a poly polypectomy as well, um, or you can do sonohysterography, which is the most sensitive modality. Good. Um, sometimes polyps can prolapse, actually. Uh, through the cervix. So if you're doing a speculum exam, you see your cervix here. Um, you'll see the cervical canal. You actually might see a polyp coming out of it. And that can be a prolapsed endometrial polyp um, that you can see on speculum exam. 
Good. Okay, now treatment will be treatment good. So for these patients, if they're symptomatic, you can do a polypectomy, right? So if these patients are having abnormal uterine bleeding, they're iron deficient and all that, you can do a polypectomy. Um, you can also send the tissue to pathology then, and you do this through hyster, uh, hysteroscopic guidance. So remember we talked about that hysteroscopy, so you can do a hysteroscopy diagnosis and then a polypectomy while you're there. Um, asymptomatic patients, it's a little more up in the air. You know, you can definitely still do a polypectomy and remove them, uh, but they divide it up into kind of what you're at risk for, right? So if you're premenopausal, remember we said premenopausal patients, um, about 1% to 2% of them are malignant or premalignant. Um, so you can do a polypectomy if you have risk factors. So premenopausal polypectomy, if risk factors for endometrial hyperplasia or carcinoma, um, if risk factors, remember, so we talked about what those are, you're on tamoxifen, you're obese, um, you know, obviously if you're premenopausal, you're not going to be taking postmenopausal hormones, but let me just scroll up, this is what I'm talking about here, so some of these risk factors um, for endometrial hyperplasia, you can also talk about um, how many children you've had, if you're on OCPs and all that kind of stuff. Um, well, it depends on what the OCP is, but anyways, polypectomy for risk factors. Um, also, if the polyp is greater than 1.5 centimeters, if there's multiple polyps, or if there's infertility, so if you're having trouble getting pregnant, or if it's prolapsed. So if you're premenopausal, it depends on risk factors, um, size, number, and then if you're having trouble getting pregnant or if it's prolapsed. If you are postmenopausal, the answer is simple. You just do the polypectomy. Postmenopausal. You're just going to do polypectomy. Okay, so um, premenopausal, there's a little more decision making. Um, if they have risk factors, if it's more than 1.5 centimeters, if there's multiple polyps, if they're in trouble getting pregnant, or if it's prolapse, do the polypectomy. Um, if not, you can just uh, watch it. If they're postmenopausal, you just do the polypectomy. And if they're symptomatic, you do the polypectomy. So the only patient you do not do a polypectomy is on premenopausal patients who don't fit into any of these criteria. Okay? Um, just FYI, uh, the literature is not uh, very supportive um, in terms of polypectomies improving fertility. Um, so for that one in particular, you know, if you are doing it for infertility, it's worth letting patients know that, you know, this might not fix the problem, um, but it's still recommended. Good, good, good. So I think that's probably good enough for now. Um, endometrial polyps, uh, we did epidemiology, risk factors, pathogenesis, clinical presentation, um, and then we have diagnosis, treatment, and yeah, so check out my video on abnormal uterine bleeding um, to get some more background on this topic. Uh, thank you for watching. Please leave some comments, questions, concerns. Let us know what you think. Subscribe, hit the bell, whatever y'all want to do, and have a great day. All right, bye-bye.